sees Kerry Sanders in Parkland, Florida, where hearts are still heavy. You're watching NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast Beat. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack with the Telos Alliance and weekend meteorologist at WSMV-TV Nashville. You're watching NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast Beat. Live from Las Vegas, this is NAB Show Live. Welcome back to NAB Show Live. I'm Brian Seth Hurst, from, Chief Storyteller from Storytech Immersive, and I'm your immersive entertainment guy. Did you ever think in this world you would be able to choose your own reality without being institutionalized for it? Well, right now, we're going to talk about augmented reality. Or as they say in New York, augmented reality. So I have four great guests who are augmented reality experts. Uh, I just want to say to my guests this morning, one of the first headlines I read was about augmented reality enabled transactions. So, you know, making economic transactions in augmented reality, I'm like, now I'm starting to feel like my dad. I don't understand this stuff. Therefore, I'm never going to use an ATM in my life. That was my father. So I'm going to go down one at a time. We have Marshall Millet from AE Mass. We have Rosario Ballesteros Casas from VR Americas. Josephine Muniz. Yes. From Candy Lab. AR. The AR. Yep. Michael Kittner from Lively Labels. Yes. Great. Welcome all. Let's talk about what each of your companies does, and then we'll augment our own reality after that. Marshall. Uh, so uh, I'm with a company called AE Mass, and we're based in San Francisco. We were largely a computer vision, uh, computer graphics workshop, and we've developed a lot of augmented reality, virtual reality tools. But our, our biggest push is for very human-centric, uh, volumetric video, spatial video technology. Do you overlay AR with volumetric? Yeah, so we have uh, uh, absolutely our oh, wait, goal. First of all, yeah. for our audience, what is volumetric scanning? Oh, so <laughs> volumetric came from L.A. a lot, and uh, there's different ways to describe it. Um, but the main idea is how do you reconstruct a space so you can actually move through it entirely? But now how do you take that from just a static thing to video, to a complete experience that you're walking through and can see from any single angle. In 3D stereoscopic? Uh, it can be viewed on a display as 3D stereoscopic, but you're creating the content from reality as a full volume. And so I could, for example, just a boxing ring, if I capture a boxing ring in volumetric, and take that and turn it around and see it from any single angle I want as a user, because you fully reconstructed it. And it's video, so it goes forwards, backwards, in time. And okay, I'm stuff. still confused, but <laughs> hopefully. I, I actually understood biometric scanning is actually being able to capture the environment complete with its lighting and, and everything, and then being able to have a much more realistic experience by being in that. So obviously that's part of it, but not all yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, great. <laughs> all right. Well, we are VR Americas. We are uh, an augmented and virtual reality company working to unleash the potential of the rain using immersive technologies, a lot of analytics, and uh, computer vision to train workforce for industries where um, there are many risks involved, like energy, utility, oil and gas, and those things. Okay, I'm going to ask you to describe computer vision. Just so you know, I've been, I've been right. asked a lot of times, <laughs> terms fly, fly by, and it's like the audience doesn't know, you know, but they don't. So, yes, computer true. vision, please. Uh, it is a, a, a way to create, in, inside of your device, the skills for the computer, for the mobile, for the phone, to understand the world as our eye understands the world. So the computer, it's to get the computer to see as you see. Yes. And, and understand, is it, this is a seat, this is a table, this is... Carpet. Creating the context for the computer. Wait, and is it combined with machine learning? Could be, but it's not necessarily needed. We can also use the digital model of the components to make the, the real object inside of the device. I'm just computer. asking if it's like three steps closer to the singularity. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Josephine, 
Yes, I'm Josephine Muniz, CEO of Candy Lab AR. We're a location-based augmented reality technology company. Our showcase product is AR Fuse um, that we're bringing to the world to developers so that they can create their own location-based augmented reality experiences. They okay. don't have to be games. They can be any location-based AR experience that you want to create. Describe what a location-based VR, sorry, AR experience looks like. If you've never experienced it, how do you describe it? If you've never experienced it, it's an experience of going from one location to the other to kind of get immersive content. You don't know what you're getting in most cases, but the story has been told by the developer, the game developer, a chief storyteller who wants um, a user to kind of feel an immersive experience when they go to a different location. Okay. Yes. So let me see if I can get an example. Yeah. I'm touring Rome. Yes. You want to tell me what I'm looking at or... You want to, if I hold up my phone, it actually could reconstruct the Colosseum in front of me so I could see what it looked like before. And it can tell you the story of the Colosseum. I think we can even bring it down to this show, NAB Live. It's a broadcast show. If you think about broadcast journalism and how you can make it more innovative, think about telling stories in locations. So if we have an NAB Live and people are in Vegas, you can tell them actual stories that happened in Vegas with a location-based augmented reality application. And you can do that with our technology a AR Fuse. Are you listening, Ryan Salazar? <laughs> <laughs> it might be worth the discussion. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you technically how, like Michael's going to show us something, but how do you map the information to the location? Like if I'm walking along, yeah. that, 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 that's a huge database. Like, it is. It is. And, and, you know, that's the one great thing about what we have. We have a real-time content delivery system. So you actually go into the back end of our portal and insert your content into the different locations using GPS or actual location data. We prefer to use GPS, um, the longitude latitude, rather than using address because, you know, we don't want to end up sending someone to the middle of the street. So if you use GPS because you're using the ma mapping data from the government, you know you're putting them in the right place. Okay, so <laughs> so Google has mapped the world. Yes. So there's plenty of those photographs. Right. So do you combine that Google database? Like, say I'm going to be at the Lutzer. You don't have to go to the Lutzer, acquire that data. You don't have to send people out into the field, right? You could just go grab any sort of reference photo of the yeah. Lutzer, marry it to GPS, and when I turn up, even if I wanted to, if I was the Las Vegas Tourist Authority, right. I get a little bing on my phone that says, do you want to know more about this? Yes? Yes. Or if you have the app on your phone and you're already within the experience um, and you know that, okay, I'm in the LA Tourist Live app, um, when you get to that location, you just open up the app and you're like, hey, I wonder what's here. And, you know, you open up the app, the camera opens up and tells you that you're close to something. You know, and directs you to oh, that information. This is so much easier it than is, I thought honestly, it was. The, the, the developers, we do the hard work. On the consumer side, it's really easy. You know, we already have consumers that are, are addicted to apps. I know I'm addicted to inst Instagram. So all you need is an addictive app There's to help get people for that there. Now. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> not only that, but because of today's society, they yeah. managed to cut the steps in half. So you only have to do six, not twelve. Exactly. But yeah, uh, we've made it easier easy for um, developers to get out there, use the technology, build the apps, and get users experiencing different AR um, experiences. Really. This is great. I mean, I know that there's heads-up displays for autos. Mercedes has a heads-up augmented reality display. I know Microsoft has a ski mask that has information and speed. There are motorcycle helmets that have that. Yeah. So that's kind of where it was in my head. Now I think about driving my my Vespa beep, beep, through a volumetric <laughs> environment, and I'm thinking, you know, brave new world, you don't even have to, and I'm not even talking about Ready Player One, I'm talking about right now. <laughs> Michael Kittner. Yes, glad to be here, uh, thank you. <laughs> a man of many talents, and uh, I know Michael from, from 360 cameras and rigs and VR rigs, but when we were talking, you said, well, I have a company called Lively Labels, and we're taking augmented reality into marketing, so I don't know how you're gonna show that. But take your best shot. Well, what we'll do is um, we'll have I have a little video short to kind of going to show you how it uh, all transpires in the uh, the real world okay. with the AR world. But what's interesting about this is um, 
when we were out there doing a ton of research for our new 360 Penguin camera, we were talking to a lot of the consumers and trying to find a, a real affordable solution. Well, during that study, we discovered that a lot of people have these nice product boxes and they want to be able to tell a story, kind of like My Brother's Keeper, you know, it's telling a story about what's behind. So what we decided to do is create these little mini short stories that live on product boxes. So, for example, we have a little video coming up here, and it's going to okay, um, Steve. kind of cue Run that it. up for us. <laughs> so, and basically what this little video is about is how an individual can walk into a grocery store and literally kind of look at a particular box and watch it come to life. So if you notice, with a phone, you can see the little blueberry dancing around on the box. So it kind of gives a little story. Now you can add audio to this. You can add uh, video to the, uh, you know, video little animation pieces. But the trick was is to be able to lock that right onto the box and stay with that individual. So as you're looking at all the different products on the shelf, if I was going to buy a product there, which one do you think you would buy? The one that's animated. I, I, I don't mean, I'm, you know, South Jersey, so blueberry is a big deal where I grew up. But, um, how is it that you're going to get consumers and modify behavior to get them to walk through the store and actually hold their phones up so they're looking for this? See, that's, that is the trick. You know, it's, it's another part of how do you work with people, how do you yeah. uh, develop that audience to explain them through that. Like here's an example. I open up the refrigerator door and my blueberry comes okay. to life. You guys should be talking. Yes. <laughs> what I see now, is, and, and frankly, this technology has been around for a while, but I've not seen the animation like this. But for you to determine, like if you guys played together, there would be more value for the consumer. Right. You would come up with a reason right. for why they would want to hold up their phone and walk through the store. Yes. Um, I, I hate the word gamification, but perhaps that's it. Um, but something like that. I want to go to Rosario for a minute because we have some, uh, some. I don't, I, I know we have four pieces, so I'm just going to ask Steve to run them one after the other. Okay, that's and fine. And then you can tell us what we're talking about. Okay, Steve? <laughs> okay, big part of the play, I think, is to make the people feel comfortable using augmented reality as part of it. The interesting thing is that, as well as virtual reality, augmented work works like our brain perception. 360. It means we are not anymore talking about flat things, flat content, and our brain is that way. Oh. Then, uh, even when our main uh, main uh, application is the training, we are also helping the industries and the and the companies to try things. We were just launching for um, uh, Telemundo, NBC Universal, something for the World Soccer Cup. Okay, we have two clips, two That's video one of clips. Those. So let's run. Let's run one clip first and let Rosario explain that. What are we watching? Uh, this is what we did for Telemundo and the World Soccer Cup. That was just the launching of the campaign. There will be one content every week and it's using uh, social networks. That way people will use what they are really using every day. The game card that they're standing on? That's the, um, the album yeah. with the stickers. For the World, Sup World Soccer Cup. Okay, so that is something that comes out every year that people are used to acquiring? This is just a campaign for the World Soccer Cup. It's very Hispanic. It's, it's important for the, I mean. So people are used to that. We love that. Then we are taking advantage of the movement of the soccer to make the people aware of the augmented reality and the possibilities with simple things. That way they will try, they will test, and then we can move them to where we want them to eat. Okay, we have a fast five second clip. <laughs> <laughs> this is also showing the same, the, okay. same, the same thing. All right, so now we've established that a few user cases, and I have to say, frankly, years ago I worked with Tim Kring on Conspiracy for Good, and we were using augmented reality with Nokia. Uh -huh. When they were, it was Nokia that was still doing phones, <laughs> that sort of became, what that turned into was Ingress, Huh? And Ingress was this game that was played by millions and millions, probably still is, of people around the world, but was kind of underground until Pokemon Go yeah. came. So do you think Pokemon Go, Marshall, do you think Pokemon Go has done anything for AR or it came and went or... 
I think it still has a, a wide daily active user base. Uh, I mean, it, it spiked and a lot of people got to explore it. And depending who in the industry you ask, they're like, oh, that's not real AR or it's something. But it, it was exposure to something that was cultural. So when you're talking about that action of asking people to do something with their phone, it absolutely proved that people will not only do it, they'll almost do it obsessively if it's the right thing. So, you know, in VR, a lot of what's sending VR forward is working with established IP. Yeah. So people recognize yeah. Star Wars, they'll run to the void to play in Star Wars. Well, and you said something in the last uh, section, and VR translates, you know, we're connected as far as industries. It was, you still have to tell a story. Yeah. And so, and AR has two things it needs. Is one, you're watching media, so it still has to be emotional and tell a story. But two, there's an interaction. There's a mechanic that has to be successful for the user. Uh, and so focusing on those two, I think, makes successful augmented reality happen. But IP and talent, if you've got real people, uh, noticeable brands, it's really attractive right away. So you have Apple's AR kit, which I just witnessed on my upgrade. I had no idea what it meant. It said the Apple <laughs> AR kit was upgraded, and I'm like, I don't know what that means, but good. Um, we've been hearing a lot of hype about AR for like the last year. As a matter of fact, before MR, which actually is combining AR and VR, before that, we kind of had like two camps, you know, and people were like, well, all the money's going to be in AR because that's going to move a lot faster than VR was moving. And so, so I want to ask, what do you think the barriers to entry are on the consumer side for people to start using AR not just from a story point of view, but from a utility point of view, like in their day-to-day -day lives. What are the barriers to that, Josephine? I think it's uh, the content. I think what we're finding is right now AR is only being seen as some as games because we saw Pokemon Go and now we know Harry Potter is coming out. So in people's minds, they think augmented reality look augmented reality is really only tied to games. But the truth is, it isn't. It can be tied to everyday lives, and the experience can start in someone's home and then end wherever they end up, whether it's the mall, whether it's their friend's house. So I think it has to do with content and lack of content, and I think that's where we find that if we give developers more access to technology that allows them to create content and put up content out there for the world, then we'll see this being used in everyday life. Rosario, you work with a lot of enterprise. Yes. Is, is it like in virtual reality right now, there's more activity on the enterprise side. There's actually more money on the enterprise side right now. Oh, yeah. Could the same thing happen with AR? Is it happening with AR? Yes, I really think so. Also bandwidth and the, the relation between when to have it online really online and some industries that that's a point there that we need to solve but but i really think it's very similar barriers well a lot of the barriers is is everybody thinks ar is gaming so just like what you're saying earlier so this is part of the reasons why during our, some of our research we realized like well how can we take the gaming out of it and really show it with products and stuff in real life for example yeah. Um, we've been working with some uh, high-end, uh, like Siemens and Dresser and and they're really high-end, you know, turbine manufacturers. And they said, "Well, Mike, how can we apply what you're doing with labels to something that we're doing in the real-world environment?" Well, what they can do is, and some of the things that we're experimenting with is a lot of products or valves, they all have labels on them of some sort, so that the technician can actually go out, show the phone on it, and it would say, this valve should be operating at this level, this is the, the, the flow of the water, you know, because a lot of the times you look at something, and is the gas going this way, is the air going this way, you know, what are the dangers and stuff, and AR literally allows you to mix your story, like what you're talking about, with real realism and then map it to that object so it's powerful so i'm going to take what you just said and i'm going to go to you marshall <laughs> yeah. because now i'm thinking you know i have seen some of the videos with the training and the the it looks like google glass maybe magic leap will be doing this and we haven't even talked about that all those yeah. billions of dollars that have gone into that but <clears throat> could you combine volumetric and ar for training exercises for the military for engineering, and how would that work? Yeah, absolutely. So talk, uh, going back to the point, which is what are the barriers to entry here, I think you know, right now you have to make content. If you're doing 3D and putting it into AR, you're creating that content. And the majority of it has been fictional 
Whereas media kind of doesn't work that way in general. You take a camera, you shoot a thing, and you have it. So how do you take real life, convert it to that 3D, and be able to utilize it? So all of a sudden, if you can do that um, from sports training to medical, happens pretty instantly, and the data becomes something you can utilize in an augmented reality experience. Well, you know, the, the mind just goes crazy when you start to think of the applications like and I'm sure they're doing it in golf. I'm sure Callaway is there. We actually see the arc of the ball and your glasses, and you see what you're doing wrong. And you're, you know. Yeah, that ability to completely explore that moment, it, it changes media entirely. Because you would be able to see even all the angles of your form. Yeah. So you yourself, you personalize it. So the largest barrier we've seen is. Uh, how does it matter to you, to anybody that's just out there anyway? Why should you care? Yeah, why should I care? And the main way media is working is selfie, right? I'm selfish. I'm taking a picture of me in front of something. So how do I get me into AR? And I think if you can, if you can figure out that mechanic, you've got uh, people that are going to sign on and they're going to be interested. They'll be obsessed. Oh. Well, that that is an interesting prospect. <laughs> I just like thinking, yes, yes, let's let's play off the selfishness of the entire world. <laughs> um, th that's a very it's very interesting. But I, I was going back for a moment to like the golf example because you know, and I don't play anymore. But like, if you're swinging and all of a sudden you're able to look at your form and that form from different angle, and instead of the instructor having to be there with you, you're now distance learning. He's manipulating that. He's turning you around and he's saying, "See the position of your back." Yeah, that's completely wrong. Uh, exactly correct. And also think of it as an overlay. You know, if I did it once and I'm repeating that, I'm seeing what I'm doing differently each time. Uh, like in a video game mechanic, it's ghosting. If you race and then you race your ghost. What if I'm doing that with my physical body and I understand I didn't lift my arm high enough or turn my ankle enough? And it's those spatial angles that is very hard to describe. Okay, you know? I just want to grab one thing. We don't have a lot of time left. This produces a heck of a lot of data, correct? It does. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Where is that data go? Who owns that data? We're in this whole thing. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg testified before Congress yesterday. Now we're creating data about your physical presence, your body, your weight, all that stuff, just like medicine. What happens? Is this a self-regulating? Is AR now have to be a self-regulating industry? I mean, we regulate our data. Um, we work closely with our lawyers to make sure that we're doing everything right, even before we bring anything into the market. And we work with the legal t legal team of our clients as well to make sure that we are protecting our consumers' data. For sure, it's owned by our client. It's owned by us. Um, is it owned by the consumer? That's a discussion that we're having right now with legal. Great. That's a discussion that has to be had. Oh. Yeah, I it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. I also think how valuable is for you giving your data for something. Yeah, what are you really receiving? Yeah, if as an employee, change? I'm trained and I'm having no risk learning how to do my job, uh, giving some data of my interaction. Yeah, audit? but there has to be these I limits around. I mean, okay, <laughs> I mean, you know, back to the electronic frontier. <laughs> <project. laughs> okay, very quickly, we have like less than two minutes left. I've, I've asked every panel, every segment that we've done, a year from now, where will we be with AR? Just take your best guess. Marshall. Well, we're very interested in, in humanizing it. Uh, you know, what we discussed, how do people get access to the tools that they can create holograms or AR or volumetric, whichever category. Uh, and I, I think that will be available in the next year. So you, we'll be able to test what people like and how they're going to engage in that socially. Rosario. Mobile. I really think that must be mobile. Okay. I think um, it's going to be something that we don't expect because as a company like ours, with, Love that. with ARFuse.com, we are giving the technology to every developer out there. So, so it's on, open source. It, it's not so much open source because it is there is a paid part to it. Okay. But what, it's, what we're doing is saying here, developers, go wild. And so if you think about developers in Africa, developers in India who don't have access to this technology, and then they're going to get it and they're going to start prototyping, uh, we I, have no idea I, what we're going to see next year. It's going to be super cool. I just think of the, the yeah. wonderful implications for social good. Yeah, exactly. And, and being able, and education, and being able to learn, exactly. and being able to see, and, and get the cultures and understand what you're looking for. Yeah. Michael. Well, I think a lot of it is, like we were saying earlier, it's massive data, just tons of data ingestion. Yeah. And, and with 360 video, 
We've already experienced that between one camera, two lenses, 10 lenses, 24 lenses. So we're all trying to start working with all of how to deal with data management. Yeah. And I think what's coming from the 360 world has kind of helped us in the AR world on how to be able to manage all that massive amount of data. So I think you're going to see bigger drives, faster systems, and cooler phones. So, <laughs> Michael, Josephine, Rosario, thank and you. Marshall, thank you so much. Thank this was you. an amazing and lively discussion. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, you can actually get AR on your phone right now. It is possible. So get out there and play. You're watching NAB Show Live from the Las Vegas Convention Center, and there's more to come. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.